come to the 13th CPR uh, area, uh, webinar on uh, climate policy. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to organize uh, this event today. Uh, it's, uh, it's a special event. Uh, the recent webinars were mostly on the uh, round table with uh, different speakers. This time we have only one speaker. Adrien is a researcher uh, at uh, CNRS in France. He, uh, he has uh, an office at uh, CIRED, uh, close by uh, from downtown Paris. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm very glad to see a young researcher uh, combining deep research in the domain and also making policy proposals. It's quite unusual and quite impressive, by the way. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for uh, the introduction. I'm very glad to present you today a global plan to fight climate change and extreme poverty. So, as you said, uh, it's a bit unusual uh, for a presentation uh, because uh, in the first part, the, I will present academic research, and in the second part, I will present an academic proposal. So, let me start uh, with the research or with the introduction. Climate change is a global problem, a global problem that requires global solutions. Lower income, lower income countries lack the capacity to tackle climate change. And without global coordination, countries also lack incentive to decarbonize. Some are doing it on their own, but some don't or do not enough. Moreover, many people ponder over the lack of fairness of the current regime. And actually many low income countries condition their decarbonization efforts on payment from high-income countries. A fair and global climate plan can address these issues. I will present it in a minute, but before, let me say that we tested this plan among the population of 20 countries, and it garnered majority support in every of them. So how can we meet the universally agreed targets to stay below T degree of global warming? How can we guarantee an emissions trajectory in line with our carbon budget? Well, a robust way to secure uh, an emissions trajectory in line with the targets is a yearly cap on global carbon emission or a global carbon price that would function in the same way. As most of you are economists, you know that the most efficient way uh, to address, uh, I mean, to price carbon uh, is with tradable uh, permits rather than non-tradable, and that we should auction these permits to polluting firms rather than give, to the, give it to them freely. And we should do it the most upstream possible. So we should regulate firms that are importing fossil fuels or extracting, extracting them rather than uh, someone filling the tank of their cars. It's more practical. So with an emissions trading system in place at the global scale, the question is how to allocate the global carbon pricing revenues. Here, there is one simple focal point, an equal cash transfers for every adult in the world. We estimate that such a global basic income would be around 30 to $50 per month, which would be enough to alleviate extreme poverty defined as someone living with less than $2 a day. Moreover, the global climate scheme that has just been outlined garners majority support in the 20 countries that we have surveyed. So let's show the support for this global climate scheme. We've done uh, several surveys uh, with uh, different co-authors. The first uh, survey is the global one uh, on 20 countries with 2,000 respondents per country. And uh, in the paper uh, by Duchesne Prêt uh, and co-authors with the Blueberry Plantro, Stephanie Sancheva, uh, Tobias Cruz, and Anna Sanchez Chico. We focus on attitudes for climate change and national policies. And the questions of this survey 
about global policies are presented in uh, the new paper by uh, myself to Adwen and Linus Matal, uh, which has just been released as a working paper. In that paper, we also run complementary surveys in the US and in four European countries that you see in yellow on the map to study in further detail the attitudes toward global policies. Let me say here that all of our surveys are very representative of the population, at least in high income countries. In middle income countries, it's mostly representative of the online population. So it's, uh, I mean, young, educated, and urban people are overrepresented. Um, but in high income countries, the quota method uh, ensures that the population frequency are closely matched in our sample. And we use the standard technique to make the survey data of highest quality possible. The survey have been conducted online with uh, specialized survey companies. So let me give the results of the global surveys. Um, so on this heat map, let's look first at the level at which policies are needed. So we ask respondents to choose um, as many boxes uh, as they wished um, for the appropriate level of climate policies. 85% of them choose the global level and only half of them choose the national or European level and even less choose a more local level. So the willingness to have global policies, uh, climate policies at the global level is confirmed when we tested global climate policies. The support for global climate policies is in general as strong as the support for the national policies that are the most supported. So let's look at these specific policies. Um, and just a precision, we asked the questions on a five Likert scale, ranging from strongly opposed to strongly support. And in this heat map, I present the relative support. So the share of uh, support answer among non-indifferent. So the first uh, policy tested is a global emission strength system. And it receives uh, generally more than 80% of relative support and an absolute majority support in every country. We don't specify in that question how we would allocate the emissions right or among the countries, what we call country shares. We do this in a subsequent question and we find a consensus in favor of allocating emission shares in proportion to the country's population, which amounts to giving the, an equal right to emit to each human. The least preferred option everywhere is grandfathering, meaning to allocate emission share in proportion to the country's current emission. Intermediate uh, support is found for more redistributive policies than the equal per capita, the one that takes into account historical responsibilities of country, or the one that gives more right to emit to uh, countries that are more vulnerable to the consequences of climate change. Other, uh, Global policies are supported by more than 80% of the respondents, like a global tax on millionaires that would finance low-income countries compliant with climate targets, or a global assembly elected on a global list whose role would be to draft international treaties to tackle climate change. Interestingly, you see that a global tax on greenhouse gas that would finance a global basic income is less supported with around 50% of support in high income countries uh, and in middle income countries, the support is as strong as for the emission strength system divided uh, in equal per capita terms. But the economic consequences of these two policies are the same. So why is there such a difference in the level of support? There are two reasons. First, people may prefer a quota than a tax 
because with the tax, they are not sure that we will meet the two degree target. Whereas for a cap on global emission, it's clear that we would. Second is the framing. When we presented the emissions trading system, we didn't explain the distributive effects. And when we presented this one, we made salient the distributive effect. So people in high income countries learned that the typical people in their country would lose out financially from the policy. So we were amazed at this stage by the strong support for global policies, especially you can see it uh, on the top of the graph. And at the same time, appearance of global policies are rare in political debate. And we wanted to understand this mismatch between a rare appearance in political debate and a strong stated support. We had several hypotheses. One was that the support was not sincere. Um, and I will present other hypotheses uh, down the line. So to test the, the, these hypotheses, assess uh, whether the support was uh, robust, we launched new surveys. And in these surveys, we mostly focus on the global climate scheme. The global climate scheme combined the last two global carbon pricing policies that I've just described. It's a global emissions trading system, not a tax, funding a global basic income. And we specified that the respondent the incidence on uh, the typical people of their country. So here is the description that we present to the respondent. We tell them that to contain global warming below two degrees, there is a maximum amount of greenhouse gases we can emit globally. That with a cap on uh, emissions, we would make fossil fuel company pays for their emission. This would lead to higher fossil fuel prices which would encourage people in companies to use less fossil fuels, eventually reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This would finance a global basic income of $30 per month for every adult that would lift out of extreme poverty the 700 million people who live with less than $2 a day. We tell the respondent that the, their typical federal respondent uh, would lose out financially, $85 a month for an American, 10 euros a month for a French person, 25 euros a month for a German one. And we conclude by presenting the policy as a climate club that would enter into force as soon as 60% of global emissions are covered by signatory countries and with possible sanctions against non-participatory countries. We don't show this to the respondent, but here is a primer on the net gains from the global climate scheme. You see, and this is in 2030. So you see that it would lead to a redistribution at the global scale from people with a carbon footprint higher than the world average to people with a carbon footprint lower than the global average. And before asking the support for the global climate scheme, we present to the respondents another policy, a national redistribution scheme. The national redistribution would tax the top incomes, the top 1% of incomes uh, in Europe, the top 5% of incomes in the US, and use the revenues to finance an equal cash transfers to uh, all people of the country. And this national redistribution would be calibrated to offset the loss of the median emitter from the global climate scheme. We added this policy because uh, we hypothesized that the support for the global climate scheme would be stronger if complemented by a national redistribution scheme. To make sure that respondents understand the policies we've described, after each description, we ask a comprehension question on the most critical aspect of the policy, the distributive effect. So after the global climate scheme, we ask in an incentivized way who would win and who would lose from the policy, expecting the respondent to answer that a typical person in their country would lose, and then the poorest humans would win. Then we give them the correct answer. 
present them the natural redistribution, ask who, who would win and lose from natural redistribution, expecting them to answer that the richest people in their country would lose and the typical people would win, giving them the correct answer, describing them again the two policies in a shorter uh, way, and uh, asking them the distributive effect of both policies combined, expecting them to answer that a typical person in their country would neither win nor lose from the two policies combined, and giving them the correct answer. After that, we describe a third policy, the national climate policies. In the US, it's called phase out. In Europe, it's thermal insulation plan. And only after that, we ask people whether they support or not the global climate scheme, and then the national redistribution scheme, and the three policies combined. You can see here that the global climate scheme receives majority support in our simple yes no question. A slight majority in the US with 54% of support and a strong majority in Europe with 76% of support. The support is equally strong for the national redistribution scheme and for the three policies combined. We have conducted um, other, I mean, we have asked other questions to test whether people would prefer a, a national distribution alone or a global climate scheme and a national redistribution combined. And as many people support uh, the combination of the two than uh, the global climate scheme alone, meaning that the support for the global climate scheme does not increase if complemented by a national redistribution scheme. This came to a surprise to us because we thought that people would be more supportive if they didn't lose from the policy. But these results suggest that people, I mean, those who are willing to support uh, a global climate policy, they are also willing to lose some dozens of dollars per month if it allows limiting climate change and alleviating extreme poverty. Now, we also tested the support for other global redistributive policies. There is very strong support for the policies that are discussed at the COP. Payments from high-income countries to low-income countries to either compensate the latter for the damages from climate change, for adaptation, or to finance climate mitigation. Two policies do not receive a majority support in every country, the consolidation of low-income countries' public debt, and putting a cap on individual wealth. In Europe, there is majority support for capping wealth at 100 million euros for each person. And in the US, where we guessed that the support would be lower, we tested a higher amount, and um, there isn't a majority to support a cap on wealth even at 10 billion dollars. A national or a global tax on millionaires are also very strongly supported, and so is a global financial register to fight tax evasion. We ask additional question on a global wealth tax. We first ask respondent to imagine that a global wealth tax is in place at the global level and uh, that the tax um, would tax wealth in excess of 5 million euros dollars. To uh, a subsample, we ask them what share of the global tax should be pooled and allocated to low-income countries. 90% of the respondents give a positive amount, and on average, respondents say that one-third should go to fund low-income countries, public services, and infrastructure. To another subsample, we asked a variant of the question in a, a bi binary uh, way. We asked them whether they would prefer that each country retains the revenue collected from the wealth tax and say that this would fund um, increased spending on education and healthcare or 
that half of the global wealth pack revenues is pooled and allocated to low-income countries. And in that case, only uh, increased spending on healthcare could be financed. Well, around half of the people prefer to allocate half of the tax revenues to low-income countries, which is consistent with the first variant, and which is a first sign that the support for global redistribution is sincere. Because here, we made the opportunity cost salient. Now, we also tested the sincerity of the support for the global climate scheme using a range of methods. The first one being a real stake petition. We asked the respondent whether they would be willing to sign a petition to one subsample uh, about the global climate scheme to another about natural redistribution. To see, we, 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 we also asked for rational redistribution to, to see whether, uh, to control, to see for uh, a normal policy, whether the support would decrease uh, in the petition format compared to the direct uh, support. And we specified to the respondent that we will send the results uh, of uh, that question to the head of state office, uh, making the petition real state. I mean, making the, the question real state because respondents don't have to actually sign the petition. As you see in the US, almost as many people are willing to sign this petition as they state they support the global climate scheme is still a majority. In Europe, the support decreases by seven percentage points, but remains uh, a strong majority. And the support decreases similarly for the national redistribution. So uh, majorities are willing to sign a rural sec petition. Another way um, we tested the sincerity is by measuring the social desirability bias. Indeed, people may be compelled to answer yes because of a social norm, even though they would secretly prefer that the global climate scheme does not take place. A way to test for a social norm is to ask an unusual question, asking among the, the policies below, and then we present a list of policies, how many do you support? And then we vary the list of policies for different respondents. For some respondents, we present national redistribution, a national climate policy, and uh, let's say death, death penalty for major crimes. And to another subsample, we present uh, another, I mean, this list, plus the global climate scheme in the list. When we compare the average number of supported policies in the two subsamples, we measure the tacit support for the global climate scheme. This method has been used to test uh, for social desirability bias um, among Russian in favor of the war in Ukraine. And it was found that um, there is 15 percentage point uh, social desirability bias. So the tacit support is 50 percentage point lower than the stated direct support for the war in Ukraine. In our case, there is no significant difference uh, in the tacit support from the direct support. The tacit support is two percentage point lower or three percentage point uh, lower, which um, is not significant uh, at the 20% uh, confidence interval. Uh, 20% threshold. So we find no evidence for a social desirability bias, and if there is one, it is small. A very interesting uh, question is this one, where we ask respondent to choose between two candidates in a hypothetical uh, election in their uh, country. Candidate A is a progressive candidate. Candidate B is a conservative candidate, each of them with a, pro a platform that corresponds 
to usual uh, progressive or conservative policies of the countries. And to one half of the sample, we add to the progressive candidates platform the global climate scheme. And what we find is that when the global climate scheme is in the progressive platform, the progressive candidate never receives a lower uh, level of support. And it even uh, receives more vote intentions in France. A progressive candidate would gain 11 percentage points in vote intention in the second round of the French presidential election by endorsing the global climate scheme. In the US, the effect is positive at, at three percentage points, uh, but not uh, significant. Uh, the p-value is 13%. And in the other countries, uh, it, it's not significant uh, at all. Another way to ask the question of uh, the electoral influence of uh, the global climate scheme is the following. We ask respondents, I mean, we, we, do, uh, we, we ask this question differently in the US and in Europe. In Europe, we ask respondents to imagine that a left-wing party or left-wing coalition will win the next election and tell them that there are two potential platforms that this party may have campaigned on. And we ask them which of the platform they would have pre they prefer that the party or the coalition would have campaigned on. In the US, we present the two platforms as the platform as of the two frontrunners in the next uh, Democratic primary. And we don't ask the question to Republicans, only to Democrats, independents, and non affiliated. So, uh, except for the global climate scheme, on average, platform A and platform B are the same because they, the, each policy of the platform is chosen randomly from a pool of progressive uh, policies. What we find is that the platform that includes the global climate scheme is preferred by 58 to 60 percent of the respondents compared to the platform that doesn't. By the way, this question is also a way to address uh, experimental demand or uh, acquiescence bias, because here respondents had no way to understand that we were interested in the global climate scheme uh, in their answer and not on the whole platform. We also asked a, a similar question. Here, uh, the complete platform is uh, totally uh, random. So the global climate scheme is sometimes in platform A, sometimes in platform B, sometimes in both platforms, sometimes in none of them. And here I present the results for the UK. On this graph, you can see the effect of including a policy compared to uh, having no policy of this domain in the platform for a platform to be preferred. So the policies that are most important to gain support, and we see that uh, in all countries, are higher spending on public services like education or healthcare, as well as a higher minimum wage. What is interesting is that this is closely followed by global redistributive policies, like a global tax on millionaires or the global climate scheme. Not increased foreign aid, by the way. Actually, the literature, there is an extensive literature on attitudes towards foreign aid, and the results are mixed. Um, in general, people overestimate uh, current foreign aid, and they are willing to support uh, more foreign aid once they know the actual amount. But uh, it's not clear cut, especially in the US. Uh, and perhaps it is because of this focus on foreign aid that the literature so far has missed the support for global policies, because foreign aid is national policy. What we see here is that uh, candidates would have an electoral gain 
of by endorsing uh, global redistributive policies. So at this stage, we have shown that the support for the global climate scheme and global redistributive policies in general is sincere. So we tested other hypotheses to explain the mismatch between a strong support and the lack of global policies in political platform or the public debate. One of these hypotheses is that of pluralistic ignorance, that a majority of people would be in favor of global redistribution, but people would think that uh, their fellow citizens are in majority opposed to global redistribution. To test that, we ask people the, their perception of the support for the global climate scheme and national redistribution scheme uh, in two random subsamples uh, among their fellow citizens. And we do this in an incentivized way. In the US, perceptions are quite accurate as the belief, the average belief is very close to the average support for both policies. In Europe, the support is underestimated by 15 percentage points for both policies, but it's not a strong evidence for pluralistic ignorance as a majority of Europeans correctly perceive that a majority of them are in favor of the global climate scheme. So we dismiss the hypothesis of pluralistic ignorance. Another hypothesis was that people don't have a consistent view. And to test that, we asked questions uh, uncovering broad underlying values. The best way uh, we tested that is uh, with an experiment. We told the respondents that they were automatically uh, enrolled into a 100 uh, euro lottery and uh, asked them, should they win the lottery prize? What share should be uh, given to an association and what share they can take for themselves? To one half of the sample, we said that the association would uh, channel the donation to an African living in poverty. And to another half, we said that the association would channel the money to a fellow citizen living in poverty. In the US, um, the donation is 2.5 percentage point higher for the poor American than for the, for the poor African. Um, but the difference is small as it is entirely driven uh, by uh, Trump voters and non-voters who donate five to six percentage point more to uh, their fellow citizens. Democrats uh, give the same to both. Uh, in Europe, uh, we don't find significant difference, which shows that there isn't uh, a national uh, bias, uh, in, at least uh, for donation. Uh, if you want, I can show other results that show that, for example, global policies uh, are given a high priority among a list of uh, different policies. Uh, just below uh, higher minimum wage and uh, better public services. Um, Results showing that most people would like that global uh, justice uh, is taken into account by uh, their country's negotiators, uh, diplomats in international negotiations. Uh, Results showing that uh, half of, uh, close to half of the people and uh, half of left-wing voters um, defend humans or uh, humans and animals when they vote, not a smaller group like themselves or their fellow citizens, and that people rank global issues like climate change higher than national inequality uh, in the importance of uh, issues. So overall, these results on universalistic values confirm that uh, there is a substantial part of people with universalist value 
uh, which is in line with majority of people supporting global redistribution. So to wrap up, we've seen that across the world, people seem ready for international solidarity. There is a consensus on a global emissions trading system where the emissions permit would be allocated on an equal per capita basis. We find majority support for global policies, including uh, when they are detrimental to one's own country. We find that the support is mostly sincere. Majorities are willing to sign a real sec petition in favor of the global climate scheme. Progressive candidates would not lose votes by endorsing it and may even win a uh, vote in France. And people largely prefer a platform that includes the global climate scheme to platform that do not. We cannot explain the mismatch between the strong support and the lack of global policies in the public debate, as most people show some adherence to universalism, and as we don't find evidence of pluralistic ignorance. People correctly guess uh, the support uh, of the public for the global climate scheme. So at this stage, we need alternative hypotheses to explain this mismatch. My favorite hypothesis at this stage is a national bias in power structure. Elections, the most important elections are at the national level. Media often target national audience. And this probably creates a bias in mental structures, and people may ignore the possibility of global policies. And even politicians may only uh, devise policies at the national scale, forgetting the global one. Another hypothesis is that there would be periodic ignorance, but only of the elites, that policymakers would um, wrongly perceive uh, global redistributive policies as unpopular. We are currently testing this hypothesis uh, using a survey on uh, members of parliament uh, in France, Germany, and the European parliament, and the preliminary results tend to dismiss the hypothesis. Um, a third hypothesis is that global redistribution is an idea whose time has come, and maybe it would enter the public debate and may even be implemented with a little push with some advocacy work. And to test the latter hypothesis, I've launched uh, with some colleagues a new association, which is entitled Global Redistribution Advocates. And this makes the transition with the second part. At Global Redistribution Advocates, we advocate for global redistributive policies supported by majorities. We've met already uh, 30 uh, people, and uh, including important ones. For example, we are meeting with the cabinet of Emmanuel Macron next week. And uh, we have written policy briefs describing each of our policies, and we've just launched petitions for each of them. So let me now describe what we propose, the Global Climate Plan. The Global Climate Plan is not our idea. It's an old idea, actually. It's perhaps even the benchmark climate policies for economics. The oldest occurrence I found uh, was from Michael Grubb in 1990. Um, and then Agarval and Narain, uh, the year after, um, pushed for an even more radical uh, version of it. Uh, Bertrand also advocated for carbon pricing at the global level with emissions rights uh, allocated on an equal per capita basis. Let me quote uh, Michael Grubb, who's, who said that by far the best combination of long-term effectiveness, feasibility, equity, and simplicity is obtained from a system based upon tradable permits for carbon emission, which are allocated on an adult per capita basis. The support for this solution has been renewed ever since, for example, by Jamison, or Raghuram Rajan um, more recently. In a book edited by uh, Crampton, uh, Ackenfeld, and Stoft, all authors agreed for a climate club involving international transfers. The chapter by Christian Gaulier and Jean Tirole synthesized the distributional decision 
of uh, this policy with a generosity parameter, which can go from zero to one with zero corresponding to full grandfathering and one to the full equal per capita option. So basically what we propose with the Global Climate Plan is to set the generosity parameter at its maximum. Frampton and uh, his co-author rely on game strategy and on the lack of generosity of country to propose that the country with average carbon emission fix the generosity parameter. Why? Because these countries will neither win nor lose from the policy, so they just want the highest possible price of carbon, and they will set the generosity parameter strategically so that the price is highest. And the price in what they propose is chosen as the minimum price proposed by participating countries. And here participating countries are serious countries. Like we exclude countries uh, which are clearly not uh, willing to uh, fight climate change. We argue that we don't have to, uh, to rely on uh, a lack of generosity of country, given uh, what I've presently, uh, previously presented, and that we should set the carbon price using our climate targets. And so it's our climate objective that should define our uh, level of ambition. Vandenberg and his co-author propose a dual track towards global carbon pricing, expanding, relying on an expanding climate club, starting uh, with countries that already implement an emissions trading system, like the European Union, integrating more countries into that, and reorienting international negotiations on the question of the distribution of efforts, the burden sharing, and on how to uh, expand an emissions trading system to the global scale. The IMF also proposed a minimum uh, price on carbon at the global level with either differentiated prices among countries or a uniform price with international transfers. These are two possible solutions that the IMF sees to solve the fairness uh, issue. The global carbon tax uh, with dividend has already been surveyed uh, before by Karatini, uh, Kelbeken, and Arlov, who found results consistent with our global survey, 80% of support in India, and uh, about half of the population supporting it in Anglo-Saxon country. As we've seen, the support is higher when uh, it's a quota uh, than with attack, than with tax. So to compute the basic income, to estimate it, we start with an emissions trajectory that is compatible with the two degrees target. We add to that a carbon price trajectory, which is consistent with the emissions reduction uh, thought. These two trajectories presented here are taken from the IPCC. And then the basic income is simply computed by multiplying CO2 emissions by the carbon price and dividing by the adult population above 15 years old. You see that the basic income is estimated to plateau at around $50 per month for about 30 years, and then decline as the world economy uh, gets closer to net zero. I don't know if I, okay, let me insist on the principle of the global climate plan. First, there would be a global cap on emissions to meet the two degree target. Defined, uh, I mean, the emissions trajectory would be defined using uh, commonly agreed carbon budgets. And um, we would use emissions trading system. I mean, we are open to uh, having carbon stacks instead of uh, emissions trading system, both uh, are equally good uh, in our mind. Um, 
let's just keep in mind that emissions trading system already cover 17% of global uh, greenhouse gas emission. It's in place in Europe, uh, China, Korea, uh, California, and it's considered by uh, many other countries, including low-income countries. Second, the global climate plan would distribute a global basic income. And the international redistribution would be massive. At its peak, the global climate plan's revenue would amount to 5% of the world GDP, and 1% of the world GDP would flow from high-income countries to low-income countries. The basic income of around $50 per month would be enough to lift out of poverty the 7 million people who live with less than $2 a day. Is $2 in purchasing parity power. So in purchasing parity power in Africa, the $50 uh, per month of the basic income uh, would be $100 a month and would be more than $2 a day. Third principle, it, it would be implemented as a climate club. It would enter into force as soon as there is enough countries participating. We take the threshold of 60% of global emission, which con corresponds to the US, the EU, China, and India, but which also corresponds to countries that win from the global climate scheme, China, and the EU and the UK. So the global climate scheme could enter into force even if the US do not participate. The global, the climate club would implement a carbon border adjustment to avoid carbon leakage and to incentivize non-participating countries to join the club. Here are the distributive effects of the global climate scheme in 2030. You may be disturbed by something here, that some middle-income countries like South Africa, Libya, Iran, or China would lose out from the policy. This may seem unfair, as populations in these countries are not rich, and beyond fairness considerations, these countries may simply not want to participate if they would lose out from the policy. And we need China in the, the, the club for it to function as China represents 30% of global emission. Don't worry, we have devised a participation mechanism, more precisely, an applied provision to account for the ability to pay of countries. How would it work? Well, countries that are not rich could opt out from the mutualization of revenues. And countries that have the possibility to opt out and who have, uh, which have a carbon footprint higher than the world average would exercise this opt-out provision. In doing so, they would retain the auction revenues collected on their territory and use these revenues as they please. Full opt-out would be authorized for countries with a GDP per capita not higher, um, that does not exceed the global average by more than 50%. And the opt out, the right to opt out, would linearly decrease up to twice the global average GDP per capita. So countries above twice the world average GDP per capita would not be allowed to opt out. This provision allows countries like China, Iran, or South Africa not to lose from the global climate plan. And this, and this provision is the main difference between the, clim the global climate scheme that I presented earlier, that was presented to the respondent, and what we call now the global climate plan. There are other participation mechanisms, for example, provisions to accommodate subnational entities into the club. Here I'm thinking of US states like California. These subnational entities would be allowed to opt out from the carbon border adjustment and to use the, their revenues as they please. So California, for example, could still use uh, the carbon pricing revenues to subsidize regulated firms instead of distributed a basic income. This way, democratic states like California, New York, Illinois, and others 
could join the global climate plan, even if the federal level doesn't. And keep in mind that US states uh, where Democrats have more than 50 percentage points of margins uh, in the election represent 40 percent of uh, the US GDP. So I agree that it would be hard to get uh, the federal level on board because it would require uh, the Democrats holding the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the presidency. But uh, we are hoping that uh, in single states could join the club. Finally, there would be a provision to avoid anti-redistributive transfers, avoiding that preventing high-income countries from winning from the policy. So in the case that is not going to happen soon, where high-income countries would have a lower than average carbon footprint, they would not be allowed to receive uh, revenues. Here are the redistributive effects of the Global Climate Plan in 2030, taking into account all participation mechanisms. As you can see, many countries are now in white, meaning that they would neither lose nor win from the policy. The policy would basically involve uh, transfers from OECD countries and uh, countries of the Arabian Peninsula to Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Here are the distributive effects aggregated throughout the century. It's the net present value using a discount rate of 4%, and it's expressed, expressed in terms or in proportion to the country's GDP. So we see that the US would lose uh, one to 2% of their GDP throughout the century, and countries like the DRC would uh, gain more than 10% of GDP, and even more in the first years, actually. The Global Climate Plan should not uh, be implemented in isolation. It is complementary with other policies. First, the basic income would increase the fiscal capacity of low-income countries, allowing this country to raise taxes to fund public services and infrastructures. Second, when carbon pricing revenue declined in the second half of the century, would be a good idea to sustain the basic income. To do that, we could mobilize new sources of, of funding by then, such as a global minimum rate uh, on corporate income. Something remains unaddressed in the Global Climate Plan, it's historical responsibilities of countries. Maybe you've seen um, the new paper by Fanning and Hickel, which came out today, and estimated that high-income countries owe uh, carbon debt in the range of twice the global GDP to low-income countries. I mean, they will all adapt at the end of the uh, decarbonization. They are still accumulating that debt by not transferring resources to low-income countries. The Global Climate Plan would address um, the, this, this uh, fairness between countries from the state of implementation, but not before. Our view is that uh, this historical responsibility is best addressed by a global wealth tax, because it's probably wealth is probably a better proxy uh, of benefit of having benefited from past emission than uh, the emission of uh, one's country. Think of Ukraine, it has emitted a lot in the past, but it is not now quite poor. It would be strange to uh, ask this country to uh, pay a strong uh, carbon debt. In high income countries, the Global Climate Plan uh, can be complemented with national redistribution to offset the negative incidence on median emitters. And in other words, we can uh, leave the bulk of the financial burden on the top 5% of income. The Global Climate Scheme would foster national climate policies instead of substitutes uh, to them. Indeed, 
If a country lowers its emissions, then it reduces the amount it will pay to the rest of the world from the emissions trading system. So countries have an incentive to uh, decarbonize through other means. And not only do they have an incentive, but it's a good idea. Um, I mean, some other climate policies are uh, to be done because by mutualizing some decarbonization costs, national climate policies can reduce horizontal inequalities. Think of uh, two persons with the same level of income and very different carbon footprint. With the global climate plan alone, the person with a high carbon footprint would lose much more than the one uh, with a low carbon footprint. If there is some solidarity uh, within a nation, then we can mutualize the cost, for example, by subsidizing insulation work, public transport, etc., so that people who already have a low carbon footprint pay part of the cost for some who have a high carbon footprint and we will also have to change their habits. Finally, we think that a global democratic climate assembly would be the best forum to choose the specificities of uh, the global climate regulation and to enforce climate governance. Let me give some uh, details on the implementation because I've shown that there is strong support among the population, but there is some challenges in the implementation. We need to monitor, report, and verify emissions of large industrial units. And this may be a challenge in countries lacking institutional capacity. But I have to say, we have to do that for any climate policy. I mean, whatever uh, the solution to climate change, we'll have to do that. And actually, the Global Climate Plan would provide resources and assistance from experienced countries. So it would probably facilitate this uh, verification of emissions compared to relying on only national policy. Where the challenge is the largest is in distributing a global basic income to remote places. We need to reach every human adult and we need to avoid fraud. We need to avoid that someone receives the basic income several times. This is challenging, but there are solutions. Most countries already maintain register of the population like electoral lists and already have um, social transfers that are effective at targeting isolated people. We can also use technology like smartphone Smartphone can provide biometric identification and are a cheap means of transaction. And for regions that are not connecting, connected to internet, satellite internet might soon become cheap and ubiquitous, according to experts. I, I won't get into the details, but we have thought of uh, details of the, the, the plan. Uh, I will conclude. Uh, with a call to action. If you liked the Global Climate Scheme, you can endorse it on globaldistributionadvocates.org. We've just launched a petition. Please uh, feel free to share uh, our petition and the policy brief. If you want to know more about the Global Climate Plan, uh, you can read it. And if you want to help our cause, well, we want to set up a scientific committee uh, to discuss the specificities of the Global Climate Plan and address scientific questions. So we would welcome uh, social scientists on board. Finally, if you have any comment or criticism, I'm ha happy to take any question or remark. And I will conclude with a two minute video by Greta Thunberg. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. 
It is the sufferings of the many which pay for the luxuries of the few. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done, rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. We cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. We need to keep the fossil fuels in the ground, and we need to focus on equity. And if solutions within this system are so impossible to find, maybe we should change the system itself. We have not come here to beg world leaders to care. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrien. Uh... Thank you.